Welcome everyone to the training, learning, and development community. Um, happy Wednesday to all of you. We have like, this is kind of an afternoon Pacific time, evening, Eastern time broadcast. And so thanks for joining us. And we've got a few people that are already in the room. Let's see, who do we have? Monica, Kim, Christiana, Darcy, Gina, thanks for being here. Um, yeah, so we're just going to get started. This is, um, is it Kristen? Is that how you say Kristen? Kristen. Torrance? Yep. Kristen Torrance. And this is a member showcase. Um, as some of you might know, we have a bunch of questions in the ask a question section down below that you can take a look at and vote up ones that you're particularly interested in. And we're just going to um, spend some time getting to know Kristen a little better. Um, so Kristen, you are an instructional designer. Yeah, I am. Um, yes. Yes. And you have like uh, a background, like was it cognitive? Wait, you have a psychology degree or something, right? I do. Yeah. So my background is in cognitive and educational psychology. Um, and so that's kind of how I got into this field. I started studying um, infants and how they learned and their their visual attention and their working memory. And it was really fascinating to me to see how people learn. And so that kind of transitioned into educational psychology to see how I can apply, you know, cognition and how people learn um, into the education space. And so, right. yeah. And and you, we were talking earlier when we were in the green room and you were talking about your journey as an accidental instructional designer. Mm -hmm. Can you like just elaborate on that a little bit? Because it seems like when I looked at your LinkedIn, LinkedIn profile, excuse me, you have a lot of skills. You like have done a bunch of stuff like you and, and I'm sort of excited to explore that a little bit. So sure. what's your journey been like as an accidental instructional designer? Yeah. So I have a, like from my learning sciences background, I really wanted to see how I can apply that. And so I ended up pursuing a graduate degree in cognitive studies, specifically in education. Um, and then during that program, I had the opportunity to learn about a number of different learning technologies um, and specifically apply cognition or learning sciences to the creation of different learning technologies. And so, um, yeah, and I felt like after I had graduated, I was really pursuing a degree or sorry, pursuing opportunities in the ed tech space. And, um, I felt like where my expertise lied was actually in the creation or like mapping of curriculum onto either game mechanics. I got really into learning games for a while or, um, you know, other sorts of learning apps or technologies. And so from there, I kind of transitioned from that interest. I transitioned into an instructional designer role without actually um, I took some instructional design like elective classes because I thought they were super interesting. Um, but I kind of fell into this role for my love of learning sciences. That's interesting. I, you know, and I can't say that I've that 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 particular journey is something I've heard a lot of folks come through. Um, and I find it fascinating, like, you know, Kim is saying what a wonderful background for for an ID and that she's a, a bit jealous. <laughs> Thanks. And I agree. It is. It, it is fascinating. Um, uh, yeah, I'm just trying to think in my head if I know anybody else that has kind of had that same same sort of um, so, sort of background. But I can think of neuroscience people, but not really from the cognitive psychology side. Um, so let's dive into a little bit more about like what you're doing, um, what you do. Like, what are you working on right now? Sure. So um, right now I'm a learning designer for an ed tech company, and we create. Um, educational technology programs that are web-based uh, for K-12. And currently I'm working on a middle school suite and I'm in particular, I'm working on like the seventh grade program. Mm -hmm. And um, this is, it's meant to be a blended learning program. And you know, now it might be more so uh, an online learning program um, as we adapt to this new normal per se. Um, but I'm, it's a neuroscience curriculum that teaches about how the brain works and teaches about um, how your brain actually grows as you learn new things and you challenge yourself. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm working on, on that program right now. It's really exciting. Um, 
I don't know if you're familiar with the research by Carol Dweck uh, of Growth Mindset. Why do I was just reading about Carol Dweck last night for some reason. Really? Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, because she has somebody. She was a Stanford teacher, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. And she has one of her students has um, kind of come up with a, a, a whole new mindset. And so I was reading about that. Fascinating. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So all of our programs uh, for the company I work for are aimed to cultivate growth mindsets in students. And we do this by teaching neuroscience and uh, teaching growth mindset strategies. Wow. Love it. So like, what can you be specific about some of the things you're working on right now? Are you, is it like the e-learning piece of it or, you know, what, what exactly are you working on? Yeah. So um, right now I, full transparency, I'm, I don't, I'm not a master of any authoring tools. <laughs> and, but right now for this particular project, I'm working with a developer and I'm actually working with a UX designer to help me create um, this e-learning program online. It's, um, we're creating animated videos, which actually I'm creating, <laughs> I'm creating animated videos and, um, I'm working with the UX designer to help me, uh, design like the look and feel and the interaction of the e-learning and then the develop, you know, the developer who's actually going to develop the right. whole thing. Um, yeah. Okay, so, is, is there any pressure on you to, to get it done quickly? Is it something that is particularly relevant because of um, the pandemic right now. And it's, you know, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yes, especially because like right now is kind of like the sales window. Like we need to probably get this done within the next couple of weeks um, in order for schools to then, you know, purchase for this for the upcoming year. Um, unfortunately, you know, schools kind of have a lot on their plate right now in terms of what they're actually deciding to spend their money on. Um, but in any case, we, it, there is some quick turnaround, especially during this time. Wow, that's fascinating. I, you know, and, and uh, here I go. I'm going to just ask you this stuff because, out of my own personal interest because I, I have a six-year-old and I've been kind of watching him, you know, um, navigate through the stuff that he has to do online. And it is so like, um, it's so primitive to me, like the types of exercises he has, he has to do. He has to work within basically a Google suite and just using the tools within that Google suite, including slides and, mm -hmm. and charts and things. And, and it, it's like awful for him because he has to figure out the interface. And I'm like, why are they putting you through this, you poor child? But like, what are you using? Because if you're developing for higher ed, what kind of tools are you using to be able to, to build stuff? Oh, sorry. I'm not developing for higher ed. I'm developing for seventh grade. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. For, for, yeah. For academic. Yeah. Yeah. For seventh grade. Yeah. So um, I know we are developing in, for the brainology suite is actually developed in HTML5. And mm -hmm. so um, we, I think we were playing around with, it used to be Flash. We're converting it now. Um, and I think, no, it's still HTML5. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is it, is it a difficult process? No, actually it's a really exciting and fun process. I think it kind of, um, it's my, like my creative outlet to be, yeah. to be honest. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> That's awesome. So what is the, what was your favorite part of what you do? That's a good question. I think, you know what, I think my favorite part about, what I do, and maybe this is the culture of my company, but I also think it's the culture of our industry in general, is um, our passion for learning. And, mm -hmm. you know, I feel like everyone I speak to is really excited to learn, is always up for growing new skills or learning new things or kind of branching out and stretching themselves. And so I think that sort of um, mindset is really motivating for me. Um, and so I love being surrounded by people who just like love to learn, love to share, um, and like to, you know, push their boundaries. And, and so, yeah, like, cause on your website and I had posted this quote in like some, uh, some promotional tweets to, for, for today's broadcast, um, you would said the beautiful thing about lifelong, lifelong learning is that the learning experience designer I can be tomorrow is still to be determined. So that obviously like is, ad, you know, admitting that you want to grow and want to continue mm -hmm. to grow and you feel like that this profession that you're in as a learning experience designer and instructional designer is 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 really kind of a growth thing for you 
Absolutely. Um, and I think I've even just grown so much in the last couple of months as an instructional designer. Um, but I, I agree. I think the lifelong learning thing, it's one of my core values, I would say. Um, I'm always looking to stretch myself. And I think, you know, through growth mindset, we know that we have the capacity to continue to grow, um, you know, until we're basically gone. And so, yeah. Love it. What is there anything that you wish you had known before you started out on this journey as a LXD or ID? Oh my gosh, yes. Um, and I would say that um, people are your best resource. I think making these connections, learning from people, having these conversations, um, even tough, like challenging conversations, like, hey, I don't know this. Like, do you know this? Um, let's do it together, you know? Um, for me, it's, I wish I would have known to help grow my network and not just in a networky salesy way, but like genuine, authentic relationships where we can support one another as a community. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I love that. That's kind <laughs> of, that's my whole point, you know, and it really is, I, I don't have any models for like what I'm doing. And, um, but that is sort of the same idea that I have is that people are an amazing resource. And, and I think that especially um, this particular group, you know, in L and D, um, you know, specifically, uh, I do feel like um, each other is a really, really kind of um, powerful thing. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's one of the reasons why these showcases exist. I love that you, uh, that you just mentioned that I, I'm, I try to convince myself of it because I've never, I don't have really any experience with it, but it feels like that's the case. And, um, just you saying that helps like sort of cement that a little bit for me. Yeah. Um, and you know, what's so cool. Sorry. To, I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, what's so cool is about our particular industry is that we're all learners, you know, and we're all willing to share. I've never met anyone, uh, thankfully knock on wood yet who has been, you know, um, against sharing a resource or a tip here and there. And so, um, just really love this community. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, um, when it comes to just that, you know, that the idea of learning, it energizes people in this space. And I just know I'm in the right place whenever, um, I get excited about hearing what other people have to say. So, um, you know, I guess I'm on the wrong, on the right track. I'm hoping anyway. Um, okay, so let's talk about, I, I saw that you have, you know, a, experience as an e-learning professional in a way on your website and on your LinkedIn profile, it almost looks like you are um, definitely someone who is proficient with e-learning. Can I ask you like what kind of tools like you like to use the, use the most? Yeah. Um, okay, so I, I love... So, so tools and any tools in general that I yeah, any tools in? in general, like that you might use in 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 how you produce your e-learning. Sure. Um, so I'm a huge fan of the Adobe Creative Suite. I'm okay. always always in there. Um, I make a lot of videos um, in particular. So I have been really trying to hone my skills in um, in using Premiere Pro and um, After Effects, which I'm sort of a newbie at, but I'm, I'm growing. And um, recently I've become a little bit more proficient in um, audio editing. And so um, using Audition a, lo a lot more. Um, let's see, I do use Captivate. Okay. Um, yeah, <laughs> I do use Captivate. Um, I wouldn't say like I'm, I've mastered it in any way. I have been taking, you know, watching tutorial videos online. Um, I think his name's Paul Wilson, who I who I follow. Um, so there's definitely some growth areas for me for authoring tools, and that's def that's something I have. It's been on my um, my bucket list for this year, or not bucket list. Um, the thing during New Year's, what is it? Uh, oh, yeah, resolution, yeah. <laughs> New Year's resolution. It was for me. It was to read more books and to learn, uh, b become more proficient at authoring tools, and so. Um, still working on that one. Wow. So that was actually, that was going to be my next question is like, what tools are you like in the process? Like, what are you wanting to learn? But one, I do think it's really interesting that, you know, when I ask you what tools you do use now as an e-learning developer, you'd name the Adobe suite, which isn't typically what I get from folks. Like they might say, you know, like Captivate or Storyline or something else like that. Um, 
usually Adobe isn't isn't something that comes up first. But I totally agree. Like having some proficiency over the Adobe suite is incredibly powerful. So mm -hmm. that's great. So is there anything specifically like aside from Captivate that you're after right now? I mean, and and how are you doing that? Are you um, what what you are learning the tools that you are learning? Is there a specific method that you're that you've chosen? Not necessarily. Well, I chose Captivate because I already had a subscription for it. And so I was like, okay, I'm not going to invest any more money in, you know, purchasing Articulate if I didn't need to. Um, plus I heard there's a pretty good learning curve if you um, learn Captivate first. I'm sure the, uh, the knowledge is transferable. Um, so yeah, that's sort of just been my approach. And um, yeah, kind of just moving at my own speed when I have the capacity to. Um, oh, one thing, one other tool that I love is um, Beyond. Uh, the, okay. It's, a, it's a, also a, a video uh, thing, but. Yeah, I've heard of Beyond. Oh, gosh. They used to be something else. And, Go uh, Animate. Right. Go Animate. Oh, I used to love those guys. Um, <laughs> but I haven't looked at their product in a, in a long time. Yeah, Christiana is saying that she loves Beyond. Okay. Great. I'm going to try to get someone from over there on, on the broadcast because they come across, um, you know, my, 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 my desk on a regular, on a regular basis. So it'd be nice to, 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 to bring them on. Um, okay. So, you know, day to day, you're doing all this instructional design stuff and is, you know, like getting into it was, is there anything in particular that keeps you inspired, keeps you going to keep producing, um, you know, and being a better instructional designer? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So I think in terms of inspiration, um, I definitely take inspiration from my family. Um, I love watching like my nieces and nephews learn. And in particular, I love watching them use technology. It blows my mind. And for me, it's super motivating to, to envision how I can create really innovative and intuitive technologies for people who can't even speak English really yet. You know, they barely can string together a sentence, but they, my niece can probably operate the YouTube app better than I could even right. fathom. <laughs> and so that's like one motivation for me. I love drawing inspiration just from, from out, outside things. And I, you know what, I would say, um, Sorry, what was your question again? Inspiration. <laughs> who, are, who are what keep you inspired? I think that one of the, I mean, one of the things about that is it's also like anybody within the industry, if there's anybody that you follow that you, you know, that is particularly sort of intriguing to you. I mean, I know it seems like universally everyone always says Kara North, but. Yeah, you know. <laughs> she's been great. She's a, the warmest welcome to me and for um tldc and also like on twitter i just got a new twitter and she uh, we've been kind of going back on twitter she actually inspired me to um create a twitter account from like watch a couple of her videos mm -hmm. um so she's definitely been an inspiration um kath ellis has been a huge inspiration nice. to yeah. me um myra roland um mm -hmm. mel Melloway as well um mm -hmm. and you want to know what i have literally just started actively really following um, people in the LND space. And I think that's why I feel like I've just grown so much. Just so many of those people put out so much amazing content all the time. And I feel like I'm constantly learning and I can't even keep up. Like I have to save them to like a folder so I can refer back to some of the resources that they put out uh, at a later yeah. time. Yeah, it almost becomes a distraction how, how <laughs> prolific they are. It's like, oh, it's like so much. How do these guys do it? But, you know, I uh, I, I try to filter as much as I can. <laughs> um, so let's talk about, do you have a particular project that you'd like to talk about that you're especially proud of? Oh, I do have a project. It got scrapped though, but it's like, mm -hmm. it was like my baby project for a while. It's really what inspired me to transition into um, instructional design. Um, so I started out as a research assistant um, and I was helping create a, a science game. So I was actually in school surveying kids um, 
about the types of technologies they like, what kind of features they like. Um, even uh, we created a PowerPoint prototype of a science game and video recorded how they, you know, went through the game. But it was like a really messy prototype, but, um, you know, low fidelity. And, um, and so it was fascinating. So that was like a project for me. We actually ended up uh, converting it into Unity and it became a full-fledged game. Uh, per, we, I even showcased it at a couple of conferences. There's this conference in DC uh, called the Ed Games Expo, Educational Games Expo, um, that I was presenting at um, for a couple of years. And that was really my, it was, I had, a project it was a project that i had spent a majority of my time on i saw it from you know um ideation to creation um and i even got to test it with kids get their feedback iterate on it um and for me that was that whole process of being so close to the user seeing them utilize the the curriculum or the, the program and then seeing the value that they got out of it was really, really inspiring to me. And I think that's when I realized that I wanted to continue in this field. Wow. So what were the ages? Uh, the ages were, we were in sixth grade, sixth to seventh grade classrooms. Wow. That's really, really cool. So it seems like you must like working with kids. I do. Yeah. So I've ha had the opportunity to um, do a couple of like, do some research with kids. I, uh, for the company I work for, we actually received a grant to test the efficacy of one of our e-learning programs. Mm -hmm. um, and so I got to go into classrooms, you know, observe, put my researcher hat on, which I hadn't, you know, had the opportunity to do since I was an undergrad. And so that was super exciting to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Um, so how, let, let me ask you, I'm just going to jump into some of these questions now. Um, yeah. Let's see. How about how do you how do you continue to learn in order to stay on top of your professional development? I love that. Um, so I love books, and I you can probably see them back there. I've been um, really trying to learn new books right now. Um, I, I joined a book club, and so I'm reading the instructional story design uh, yeah. book, and. So that's what I'm currently learning. So books are definitely, you know, a resource. I've recently gotten into um, instructional design podcasts more. Um, so I'll, I'll put those on my, like on my phone when I'm out doing something. Um, but I've really, I have a lot of trouble multitasking, so I can't listen and work at the same time. Um, so yeah, I, I know some people are able to, you know, have it on in the background, but I get so distracted because I just love learning and I can't pay attention yeah. to two things at once. So, um, and I would say I've been trying to attend more conferences or yeah. virtual webinars online. Um, yeah. And yeah, if anyone has any recommendations for some conferences, please let me know. <laughs> um, I'm, you know, would love to learn and continue to grow. No, that's great. And I find like just if you surround yourself with you sort of this topical media, like, you know, like podcasts and and webinars and books, things that, you know, just sort of keep your head within that space. Um, it makes you it forces you to just focus more on whatever your goals are and and just like sort of stick with it. And, um, you know, and I'm, I have a problem because now I'm, I just get distracted all the time with news cycles and things <laughs> like that. So. I'm doing the same thing. I'm trying to filter out everything that, you know, doesn't have to do with the things that are important to me and just like focus on that. Is there any particular book right now that sort of sticks out in your head that you've been reading that, that has to do with, um, with your career that you could recommend? So it's applicable to my career. I just finished reading it. I would say it's applicable, but it's not um, directly related to instructional design, um, but I think it's really helped shape me. So I just finished reading Daring Greatly by Brene Brown. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if you're familiar with her, but she's a researcher who researches, um, <laughs> she's a researcher at the University of Houston who researches uh, shame and vulnerability. And um, she, well, her book is really about how 
courage is the, you can only have courage if you are willing to be vulnerable. Yeah. And for me, actually, when I pushed publish on my website, which is new, by the way, I just published it, I want to say last month. Yeah. Um, I was like, I'm going to step into the arena. I'm going to be brave and um, I'm just going to be daring greatly. And that's really having those words in my head are what really pushed me to, um, I guess, not be scared or worried or be anxious about um, putting yourself out there. Um, and so she gave me a lot, of, that book gave me a lot of confidence um, as, as a self person. I love it. I love Brene Brown. I can't say that I've read any of her books. I've, I've seen interviews with her and I've seen lots of like, I think I've, you know, just occasional sort of quotes and essays that she's written and she is, she's absolutely fantastic. And, and, you know, that vulnerability is really, really important. And I posted a link to, to your website there. So Thanks. everyone check it out. I think you did an excellent job with the website and, uh, and, and so that's great. And I, I know like from that vulnerability sort of perspective, and I'm sure Kim can, can identify um, even in art and in music, that's sort of like, that is one of the most powerful things you can do is kind of just admit um, how vulnerable you are, but, you know, be honest and just, you know, send it out to the universe and keep your Absolutely. <laughs> it's sort of bounce off of you. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And Christiana, thanks. I, I should get like the audio book for, uh, for, for Brene Brown. Absolutely. Um, all right. Let's see. Let me, let me grab another question here. Um, best compliment you've ever received. Ooh, that's a good one. <laughs> I would say, I would say, and this is sort of generic, but, um, I love it when like a client is able to say, I had a pleasure working with you. You brought a lot of value. Mm -hmm. I think nothing means more to me than being able to help people like that. You know? Yeah. yeah. No, that's awesome. I think it's just sort of a universal thing for, um, I think pretty much every membership has <laughs> been, you know, just that, that ability to, to, to help others. It's um, this particular group is so service oriented and, um, and it's, you know, one of the reasons why it's always a pleasure to be able to, to, um, to, to, to talk to everyone on here. So, okay, we've hit 30 minutes, but I'm going to keep on going with a couple things because one, Darcy had posted this question on here that we both looked at when we were in the <laughs> green room and we're like, uh oh, can we answer this one? So we're also going to throw this one out um, to the audience as well, please. So Darcy is asking, um, what key steps should an instructional designer take if they wish to become more of a leader in their field and career. And, you know, I'm going to start off just saying that from, you know, from, from my experience, what I've seen is, is basically sort of the networking and the people part of it. If you want to get ahead as an instructional designer and really kind of, you know, um, sort of step up or, or hit a new level, that's been a big part of it. Like start speaking at events, start sharing mm -hmm. your knowledge, like establish, um, you know, sort of your, your, uh, you know, your value. Um, and, and that's, I'll start off there, but I don't know if you have anything you can add to that at all, Kristen. Yeah. Um, you know what? I think I would just say, try to overcome any sort of imposter syndrome and step into the arena, you know, be courageous, be vulnerable. Um, cause most people are, um, and, you know, we, I think it's better to have people see your more authentic self than to have armor around you. And so I think, you know, dare to keep learning, try to thrive um, and just be a lifelong learner, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Like Kim is saying, generosity is a key to leadership. Think of think of Kara, and I do yes. think that, that that that's that's very accurate. So Darcy, I don't know if that helps at all. If um if if you do want your profile to increase, and you know you just want to showcase stuff, let me know. I'd be happy to 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 have you on as as a broadcast. So um and anybody out there that's in the audience, 
um, that's kind of what TLDC is for is to just help people um, be able to, you know, just share knowledge. So, um, yeah, so I think we, we did okay on that one, Kristen, right? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> we were really nervous. I was really nervous about it. I was like, I don't know if I can answer that question. <laughs> so, um, most common misconception people have about you. Ooh. Um, so this could be, you know, maybe just my family, but, um, I think a lot of them like assume that I am a teacher or I would be a good teacher. Um, and I think that's, that's definitely, I take that as a compliment. Yeah. However, I would say that the skill set for a learning designer is fairly different than a teacher who is able to go into class every day, uh, be able to um, meet the needs of students, both emotionally and cognitively, and be able to off the cuff respond to them. I think that requires you know, a whole different skill set that I am not prepared with yet. Um, yeah. So I'd say that's one common misconception um, that I often face because I'll, I'll tell people, you know, I'm in I'm in education, um, I'm in ed tech, um, and they automatically assume that I, you know, am am teaching. And although I have done you know professional learning trainings, um, I have never kind of facilitated or instructed like say like a semester long class. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> interesting. Interesting. You, it, it sounds like there might be a little imposter syndrome there too. I mean, maybe, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. Where can, um, where can people connect with you online? Sure. So um, I am on LinkedIn. I think I might be the only Kristen Torrance with a E N C E on, on LinkedIn. Um, I also have a new Twitter um, and my, Handle is Chris K R I S Torrance T O R R E N C E L X D. All right, I will post that in. Well, actually, after we wrap up here, um, yeah, okay. So I think that's about it, Kristen. Thank you so much for doing this today. Um, I forgot to mention to everybody, um, first ever uh, pure like Filipino TLDC broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a new one i didn't get to any of your questions i did want to find out more about how you got to like you're in irvine now but you mm -hmm. were, went to uc davis and you moved to new york and now you're in irvine but um we'll have to save that for another broadcast sounds good thanks right. so much for having me i really appreciate Absolutely. it Thanks for coming on. Thanks everybody for um, Thanks, for joining us today. And next week I'm going to have one community discussion, have a, another potential broadcast happening, but I'm trying to keep busy. If you guys have any ideas at all for any other broadcast, let me know. Um, I feel them all the time in, um, in our Slack group at tldchat.us and um, would love any ideas that you guys have. Um, thanks everybody. And uh, we'll see you next week. Yeah.